Welcome back to the Down South Hunting Podcast presented to you by the Onyx Hunt app. Actually, I'm not sure it's still presented by Onyx. It's been probably over a year, but I haven't got back with them about re-sponsoring us this year because who wants to sponsor a podcast that you never know when the episodes are going to come out? Um, it's <laughs> I promised you guys I was going to get some more, and I've had, I think, three or four interviews cancel this month already, but uh, I'm really excited to have Tony Peterson talk about dove hunting with us, and uh, we had a really fun conversation, so we'll get back to that, but I will tell you who will sponsor a podcast that who knows when it's going to come out. That's going to be huntinggeardeals.com. Make sure you are checking that out now. We just posted a brand new Labor Day sale that's got a compilation of all the best deals for Labor Day. That's going to be updated throughout this weekend. Obviously, that's if you're listening before Labor Day. If it's after, maybe you're listening on this Monday, you can catch the deals. If not, hunting season is just getting cranked up, and there are a lot of really good deals and sales to be had, and things are going to get better and better all the way up through Black Friday. And then, of course, you got to get your family checking it out for Christmas gifts. So huntinggeardeals.com, make sure you join the email list and you'll get those deals right in your inbox every day. Going back to Onyx though, I was able to get out and do a little bit of scouting this last weekend. And at first I was really disheartened. I haven't been to this, last year I didn't really hunt this area but maybe one time now with the kids. And I went back into this area and there's like flagging tape everywhere. But as I got around scouting, I realized they're doing some type of research project or something, and I found all these little dug up areas with flagging tape hanging over it. So I hung a couple cameras. I'm gonna be interested to see how that affects the deer in the area. Hopefully I'm still getting daylight pictures of bucks. What I always like to do is try to hang my cameras over scrapes, which is, you know, this being the end of August is about the earliest. I found a couple scrapes where I could do it at, uh, I think they're just getting out of velvet in my area, so I'm excited to see some pictures on that. I also hung a new Spy Point Link tram, trail camera I got this year, and I'm going to be doing a video review of that on Hunting Gear Deals, so look forward to that too. Getting back to this episode, we talked to Tony Peterson. I actually was looking around for somebody I could talk to about dove hunting, but what I didn't want to do is talk to somebody you know, while it's interesting to have like a family tradition and hunt around the field, usually that's like one or one or two weekend type deal. And I wanted to find somebody that's got some different techniques and tactics. So while Tony is not from the South, he's from Minnesota, you know, in the up North, a lot of times they're not using those same big field tactics that, that we have down here. So I thought it'd be interesting to get a little different perspective on it. I actually had another guy lined up from Kansas who was going to do it with me. And uh, he's actually on a SWAT team. I don't know like how, I, I won't mention his name because I don't know, you know, whether it's cool to mention all this or not, but he's on a SWAT team and had like a, a huge operation going on. So we had to postpone for that. And then he ended up getting hurt during the operation. So I ended up having to find somebody else, but um, I, I appreciate Tony getting with me on, on short notice. It was really an interesting, fun conversation where we got off of dove hunting quite a bit. We talked a lot about deer hunting. And we also got into outdoor writing. Uh, Tony's an outdoor writer and also hosts a couple podcasts. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more with the interview. There is one other thing I wanted to tell you, and hopefully I'm not upsetting any of my Georgia public land listeners by sharing this, but uh, I was listening to Brian Grossman's podcast, uh, Georgia Field, a while back, um, and he was talking about the upcoming season and what he was doing to get ready. And he talked about these public land quota hunts that you needed to put in by the 1st of September. So I got to thinking about it and thought, well, you know, I ought to put in and start gaining points there. So when I got on their website, I realized you don't even have to have a license or anything to apply for their points. So you can apply there just for a point. So you're building a point for their better hunts and it doesn't cost anything. So if you're listening before September 1st, you need to get on and do that. If you're listening after that, then I guess you just need to remember for next summer. But hopefully y'all are subscribed and you listen to the podcast right away so you can catch on to that. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump to this interview with Tony. Had a great time talking to him. He and I actually talked for like half an hour afterwards. Um, just a really good guy to talk to. I hope you enjoy the episode. If you're not so excited about the dove hunting, Stick it out, and uh, we're going to get into some deer hunting stuff too. But uh, it's 
there's some great tips in there on how to dove hunt on your own. If you don't have a club that you're a part of or family land with crop fields and that kind of stuff, and you want to get out early and get some birds, Tony's got some great advice for us. All right, we have the beginning of hunting season coming up, and that means dove season. And I'm excited to have Tony Peterson. He's an outdoor writer and podcaster. And as I was searching through the internet for somebody good to talk to about dove hunting, his name kept popping up. Actually, not just for dove hunting, but he is a wealth of information for outdoor outdoor writing and podcasting, that kind of stuff. So I'm excited to have him, have him on the show. Welcome, Tony. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited. I, okay. I'm personally not much of a dove hunter. I've, I think I've maybe gone once or twice. We talked about this earlier. I don't have any dove hunting property real close to me. Uh, but after this conversation, I might be out looking for somewhere to use my new wealth of knowledge coming from you. <laughs> so, uh, but I do want to share the information because my goal is to move to the country where I can just walk out the back door or walk to the local WMA and and give this a shot. So I'm excited about talking dove hunting and I've asked some questions of the hunting in the South group and got some answers. So I'm excited about this. Could you just, I guess, start out by just introducing us to you and, and tell us about uh, your writing and your podcasting and what kind of hunting you like to do? Sure. Um, you know, I live, I live up here in Minnesota and I've been, uh, an outdoor writer since basically 2003 and worked for a pile of different publications over the years, you know, Peterson's bow hunting, bow hunter magazine, North American whitetail, gun dog, wild fowl. Um, just, just a lot of different, uh, a lot of different platforms out there. And I also host a, a podcast called sporting dog talk. That's all about, uh, working dogs and hunting dogs, and then another podcast called Hunt for Real that's all do it yourself, a lot of public land hunting. So I've been I've been in this space a long time. I love all kinds of hunting and uh, just just got lucky and end up making it kind of my career um to this point anyway. What are your main I guess do you have like as an outdoor writer, do you have like main ex expertise areas that you typically write about or is it kind of you have to be a jack of all trades with that? Um, I, you know, I would say that I'm most well known for, uh, public land whitetails, uh, bow hunting, public land whitetails, I should say, but my, you know, that that's always been my passion. I love Western hunting and all kinds of stuff. But the other thing that I just really, really love that I write about a lot is anything you can do with dogs in the field. So whether that's doves or ducks or pheasants, grouse, whatever, um, that's the other thing that I just it's it's my favorite to write about and talk about and do uh, besides bow hunting whitetails. Okay, so I would be an idiot if I let you go before the end of the podcast without asking a few whitetail questions. So uh, for, for those of you that <laughs> don't want to hear the dove stuff, maybe you can skip to the end and we'll we'll ask a couple whitetail questions. Um, before we get into the dove stuff, you said you got a, a whitetail trip coming up too, right around the corner, right? Uh, I do. I've got uh, quite a few of them, actually. But, you know, tomorrow night, uh, I'm I'm heading down to Nebraska, kind of in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, with a buddy of mine. We're going to camp and hunt some public land and hopefully run across a velvet buck out there, although they'll be uh, they'll be losing their velvet probably in the week that we're there. But uh, it should be it should be a good trip anyway. It's the weather setting up nice. And I think it's I think it's going to be pretty fun. That sounds awesome. Is that going to be are you going to be doing like spot and stock or are you set up in bottoms? How does that hunt typically work? Um, you know, because of the timing of the year, it, it'd be, it would normally be a water hole type of hunt. I've got a whole bunch of cattle tanks and ponds marked that I want to hike into and check, but we kind of have an extended cool front, uh, where I don't know if the water is going to be quite as big of a draw. So now we're kind of scrambling to, to find some spots that relate to food and, you know, cause this is an early season thing. And so, we, we, because of the public land doesn't have a lot of the destination food sources on it, but it might have good bedding cover. It'll be kind of one of those deals where we're just looking for those transition routes where it's a bed to food, food to bed thing. That has to be one of the few times when somebody's looking forward to a hunt and, and hoping it doesn't have a cold front coming through when you're, when you're down hunting. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm kind of an anomaly that way, but I just think that when you're dealing with whitetails, um, you know, as long as you're not in a place where there's water everywhere, if there's some limited water, I like it hot, you know, especially on public land because it keeps people out. They don't want to bow hunt when it's 85, 90 degrees and those deer are going to drink every day. Yeah. We actually did a pretty interesting series on, uh, patterning deer according to the weather. 
Uh, and they're basically, we interviewed biologists about all these GPS studies they have, and there was no correlation in between deer movement and temperature. Um, I think it was like a three-part series. I think it was 51 through 53, if anybody wants to go back and listen. Um, but it's, I don't know. It's it's mind-boggling to me to think that, I don't know, it just seems so counterintuitive. After having gone through the whole thing, I believe everybody I've talked to, um, as far as like the truthfulness and the accurateness of the study, but I still can't buy into it 100%. You know, uh, that's, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and listen to those because... What what I've learned in my life, you know, as an outdoor writer who kind of depends on killing public land whitetails for its job, I don't I don't get to take days off. So if it's hot, cold, windy, whatever weather you've got coming in, it's if I have time to hunt, I have to go. And what I've realized is a lot of the things we say about whitetail movement, you know, like, oh, it's it's too windy. They're not going to move or it's too hot or any anything like that it really doesn't hold a lot of water with me. Like when you, when you get out there and you have to hunt through those conditions, you see that it doesn't really seem to affect them that much. So I, I, I'd be curious about that. Cause I, I think I would agree. Yeah. It, it's really interesting. So I talked to somebody like you and then I'm, I'm talking to all these biologists who are like, obviously know what they're talking about very well. They they're looking at GPS tracking that's, you know, marking these deer every 15 minutes. But then as part of that series, I talked to Mark Drury who is adamant, you know, they have a whole app and everything focused just around the weather. And, and I believe Mark Jury too, you know, it's (laughs) well, so so, yeah, but you got to look at what's going on there, right? If you have, you know, if you have control of large tracts of deer land and nobody's going in there to mess with them, they don't, they've been babysat their whole lives till they're five and a half, six and a half years old you can pick and choose the absolute perfect conditions to go out because there's not a whole lot else that's going to weigh into that deer movement. But if you're, you know, if you're hunting public land, you're hunting a different kind of deer. I mean, you're, you're hunting deer that are reacting to, to hunting pressure. And there's a whole lot more going on than there is on a, like a real tightly controlled property. Oh, it sounds like I should have had you on there too, just to get the perspective (laughs) on it. But yeah, you might, you might find it interesting. Um, all right. So let's get back to dove hunting. So, um, other, th- well, I, I won't even put any words in your mouth. What is the appeal of, of dove hunting? Oh man, there's a, there's a lot to it. I think, um, you know, for us, you know, up, up here in Minnesota, we haven't had dove hunting. We don't have a dove hunting tradition like you do in a lot of places down South. You know, we've, we're one of those Northern States that's kind of, uh, been late to the game. And so it's been a, a different experience for a lot of us up here, but, you know, what it offers is an early hunt, a lot of September one openers, which is nice because, you know, in a lot of places you might not be able to deer hunt up here until, uh, you know, mid September or even October one, depending on where you're at. So you can get out early. Um, you don't, you know, the weather's usually awesome. So you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to, uh, you know, there's no trophy doves. It's just every dove you see is the same kind of dove and it's awesome. They're good to eat. You don't have to be super quiet. It's like a low, cost thing to get into i mean really you gotta you know sit on a bucket or sit on a chair and bring out the 20 gauge and shoot some some light loads and it's it's like uh you know it'll cost you like you know a hundredth or or you know it's such a small commitment compared to duck hunting or even some of the other times types of upland hunting that it's like a it's kind of just a no-brainer to get into yeah, and you were mentioning too, it's really good for for kids and uh, and groups of people as well. Just the social aspect of it. Sure, you know, I mean that's that's a southern thing more than we see up here. The social side of it, but that was the first. Uh, you know, dove hunting was the first thing I brought my little girls out to do, because you know it's it's you can do it all day. You can you know hide in the cornfield. You don't have to be super quiet, and it's it's a good thing for young dogs too. It's it's a really good steadiness type of hunting that relates to duck hunting and some other kinds of hunting, and it's 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 just a good start for a lot of things. Okay, so let's just start at the basics. Obviously, um, you know some of this is going to be pretty simple. If maybe you've been dove hunting for your with your family or a group for years and years, maybe, maybe you won't need the basics quite as much and we'll get into some more advanced stuff. Uh, but just starting out at the basics, as far as equipment goes, like what, what type of shotgun do you recommend? I I would imagine most people just have a shotgun and they use it for their turkey season, maybe with a choke or something like that. 
and you know like you already started to mention a couple of their equipment things but but what would you get to get started doing this um you know you can a 12 gauge or a 20 gauge you know i mean i, I don't get uh I'm not one of those people that gets too worked up about guns. I mean, I love them, but they're kind of a tool for me. And so depending on how my scouting is gone, I might grab my 12 gauge, you know, I, I shoot a semi-auto Browning, or I might grab my little over and under 20 gauge, uh, that little Weatherby Orion that I love. Um, it doesn't really, you know, I would never go out and buy a, a you know, dove specific gun, but uh, if you have a 12 or a 20 gauge, you're pretty well set up. Okay, what kind of ammo do you typically typically use? Um, you know, I've messed around with uh, you know target loads that are seven and a halfs or sixes, high brass, low brass. Um, I've shot that the I think it's Federal's Prairie Storm. Um, sometimes I'll I'll shoot that in a three inch load with like uh, sixes if I'm if I want to take my twenty gauge out, but they might be flying a little higher. You know, it's it kind of depends on the situation. If you're if you're running a, like a motion decoy and they're coming in real well and landing in a specific spot, um, you know, you can you can you you're dealing with a different kind of ammo or a shot shell than you are if they're you know cruising past at you know right at the the top of your range and you know going from point A to point B like a dove can. So it kind of it kind of depends on the situation. Okay. Um, well, how about a typical, well, maybe as we kind of go through some of these scenarios, just kind of fill us in as to, you know, what kind of setup you'd, you'd normally have then is, do you typically do any like patterning or anything along that, that lines? Um, I have, you know, typically if I do that, it's cause I take the girls out to shoot a little bit and I'll, I'll just kind of check in, you know, the, the guns that I use, uh, I've been shooting them so long and they, they go into the field with me for woodcock and grouse and pheasants and ducks that I'm pretty comfortable with them. And I just know them pretty well. But if, if I were going to go out and buy a new gun or I was going to take a new gun dove hunting, then yes, I would pattern it for sure. I guess the nice thing about dove hunting is, uh, you know, you certainly don't want to be injuring birds, but really like, it almost seems like missing is part of it. <laughs> so so <laughs> you don't have to if you miss- know, obsess over your equipment as much. Well, I mean, you're, yeah, you're going to miss. I mean, you, you want to do the things to do, you know, get yourself into the best spot to make better shots, but shooting at doves is a inexact science. You're going to miss a lot. So what are some ways you'd recommend practicing, uh, practicing your shooting before the season starts? Shoot at some clay, man. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, the thing about doves, they're so deceptively fast and, I, I learned this photographing them. I was I, I got to go down to Argentina a few years ago and do the duck and dove thing. And, you know, you get more dove experience down there in an afternoon than you I would get in Minnesota in ten years. I mean, it's it's mind blowing. But what I what I realized shooting and then just running camera was kind of how good they were at just little fighter jet maneuvers and juking and they are they are an incredible little bird. And they're just tough to hit. And so if you get used to the lead time on, you know, shooting clay pigeons and doing some trap shooting, you're going to be better off when it comes to doves, but it's still, it still takes experience hunting doves. Can you give us some tips as far as like technique as to, you know, leading or that kind of stuff? How, how you typically, like, let's say you're teaching your girls how to shoot the clays. What walk us through that? Um, you know, it's, it's all about lead, lead and follow through. And with doves, you know, you can, it, it would probably be a pretty rare day if you went out to pass shoot doves and you were shooting in front of them. So it's almost always, and, and this is wing shooting in general, uh, you're, you're almost always shooting behind them. And so it's a, it's sort of a mental thing where you want to put that bead on them and shoot. But if you do that, you know, your pattern's going to be behind them every time. And so it's like, a it's the process of learning to get that bead ahead of them and follow through with their, you know, kind of their flight line. And it's just, uh, you, you can do that with clay pigeons too. You don't need You don't usually need as much of a lead, but it's just a matter of, it's kind of like instinctively shooting a, a recurve bow, you know, like you, you got to do it a lot to understand what this individual shot calls for. And it just takes experience. And, and by pass shooting, you're, you're starting with your bead behind him and you're sweeping through and, and pulling the trigger once that bead gets in front of him, once you see some air in front of him, is that right? Yep. And it's, it's a matter, you know, if you, if you touch off both barrels and there aren't any feathers falling, you probably didn't lead them enough. And so the next time, you know, it's, it's a matter of getting ahead of them a little bit farther with that bead and figuring out, and that was, 
that was what blew my mind in in Argentina is we got to shoot so much that you got to you know work on your lead shot after shot after shot and realize like it clicks in your head you're like man I got to be way ahead of these birds to hit them every time and but once you get to the, that experience you realize like where it's got to be and it, that's a hard thing for for new hunters to get is just that you know you're not even aiming you, you know you think you're supposed to aim at the bird and you're aiming ahead of the bird and and following through and it's just it's a mental thing that's hard to get over right so and obviously it depends on which angle they're coming in and that kind of stuff but I, I sure. imagine a lot of hopefully you're setting up so you're getting more broadside shots is that right um yeah you know i mean it's if you want easier shooting you want to just scout out a place that the doves want to be you know a, a, a come you know straight in shot or a straight out shot is a heck of a lot easier um and also you know if they swing in on a on a roost tree or they swing in on a pond or you've got a you've identified some kind of like tight food source like up here uh, where I live, we f we find these little field roads that have a lot of foxtail in them, and those doves will come in and pick gravel and and grab the seeds out of the foxtail. And so if you run a uh, a spinning wing decoy, you can get them to to come in and decoy really well. Then you're then you're dealing with a different kind of shot where they're not just streaking past uh, you know at full speed, and that's that's a lot easier to it's it's a lot easier to uh, up your percentage a little bit. Okay, so what about camo? I know. You know, some people always just hunt in blue jeans and some people get all decked out. What's your feeling on camo for dove hunting? Um, you know, it's, it's, it depends what kind of situation you're in. If you're, if you're on a field and there's a ton of birds, you know, coming and going, it's probably not that necessary, but I think part of it has to deal with, you know, whether you're, whether you're hunting migrators or you're hunting residents. And here, you know, in my experience in the couple States I've hunted doves, it's, it's been early in the season and it doesn't feel like you're hunting, uh, you know, migrators coming through swinging on down South. It's, it's birds that live there and they get pretty wise. If, you know, every time they swing into a, you know, a little pond, they get shot at, you know, yeah. you're not, you know, you're not going to get away with too much sloppy stuff. And so I don't know if it's just all in my head, but I, I like to camo up and hide a little bit. And I, you know, there, I'm sure there are situations out there where it absolutely doesn't matter, but it's kind of like a little, you know, it doesn't take much to throw on some camo and, and hide a little bit, you know, so it, why not try it? Yeah. I think it's probably one of the situations where if you are hunting opening day and the birds haven't been hunted for a year, or most of them probably have never seen, you know, anybody shooting at them before. It probably doesn't matter so much, but, uh, yeah, like here in Florida, we've got three different seasons. So, and I know as those move on, the hunting gets tougher and, and probably the people that are using the same technique as they did on day one, it's not working, but, but you know, those, the people that are dedicated to it probably see success the whole season. Yep. Yeah. I would agree with that. Okay. So, um, how about scouting? Well, it's, let's say you've decided you're going to do this. You've got a shotgun, you shoot some some clay pigeons where do you start as far as where to look maybe there's like a, a local wma that's you know open for hunting season a couple of weeks before deer season so you just want to get out in the field where do we start um yeah you know you got to start with where you can hunt and for me i you know i'm keeping an eye out anyway you know if i see a bunch of birds on a wire or birds going into a field um, if I'm out scouting deer or scouting ducks on some public land and I flush some, some doves off of a pond, I'm, I'm taking note of all that stuff, but I'm not paying as much attention to birds that are in places where I can't hunt, uh, cause it just doesn't do me any good. So my scouting personally almost always centers around public land. So I know if I find birds, at least I can hunt them. And that's, you know, that the, the access thing with hunters today, that's, that's the biggest issue we have and getting getting on to ground so if you've got a private place to hunt and you can do it get out there and get out there at first light and do some glass and take a walk around see what you see for doves um if you've if you've got to hunt public land you know same rules apply and you're going to want to get out there and kind of ground truth everything and see okay you know are there birds using this are there birds on nearby wires where are they flying when i see them flying because that matters a lot you know we we kind of attribute uh, a lot of randomness to animal movement, and I don't think there's a lot of randomness in nature. I don't. I think doves, when they fly, they know where they're going. And if you sit and watch long enough, and I'm sure I'm sure your listeners who hunt, you know, big fields down south, see this where there's just like these flyways up there, where they just 
they go more, you know, they're not just randomly flying all over the sky. They have a destination in mind and they have a way to get there. And so when you're starting a new spot, anytime you can identify those flyways, man, you're, you're going to be so much closer to the, the X than just, you know, any other way you could scout, I think. You know, I got to think too, uh, getting dove permission on private property would be a whole lot easier than public too. So, um, you know, with Onyx now you can easily find, uh, you know, the, who the property owner is that kind of stuff. Probably if you're driving by an ag field and, uh, you know, you see doves out there, I bet it's a lot easier, especially if you bring your kids, uh, yep. uh to get, to get permission. So, um, if you're, when you're scouting these public properties, are you spending most of the time in your car or you're just getting out of the parking area and, and walking? Like where, where do you start walking? You know, I, I would have an idea where to walk if I'm looking for deer. Um, but other than like, say a field edge, I, I wouldn't really know so much for dove. So, you know, my strategy, you know, you mentioned on X, I'm going to look at some aerial photography before I go in. And if I can find a pond with a dead tree on it, that's where I'm going to go first to mm-hmm. watch. Um, you see, you know, they come to water a lot, but you also see, they just, they choose dead trees to land in. And some of the best spots I find, I don't know if they just, uh, they like to loaf in the middle of the day, you know, they, they're going to get out and go feed early in the morning. And some of the places I find they'll come in throughout the middle of the day to land in specific trees. Sometimes that's tied to water. Sometimes it's not. And I don't know if they just, they, you know, they filled their bellies in the morning and they're just uh, going to chill out for a little bit. Um, but you can, you see stuff like that. So I always carry binoculars with me uh, and take a walk. And so you're looking for, you know, I'm looking for water with a dead tree on it. I'm looking for, you know, maybe an old homestead with some dead trees in it. And, you know, if I have, if I have my binos with, I can glass them and see if there's any doves in there. Or if I see birds flying, I can follow them with the binoculars. And then any kind of, uh, any kind of field that might have, you know, up here, it's primarily corn, uh, soybeans, maybe alfalfa. None of those are all that good of a draw for doves, but around the edges, you'll find that foxtail and some of the weed seed and stuff that they like, or you might find a waterway, uh, maybe that the, the seed didn't take or something that kind of grew over fallow. You, you might find something like that that they're keying on. And so it's just, it's kind of a matter of getting out there and taking note of where you see them fly, where you see them land and where you jump them. Are they, do they focus on roads a lot too, where you could, I mean, if you're just driving down the road and you, uh, you know, you're driving down and a bunch fly up, are is it typically going to be back in that same area kind of going along with your patterning or is it more random? Oh, they, you know, they're pretty predictable. You know, if you see them, I, I kind of like if I, if I see more than a couple on a wire or more than a couple jump out of a specific spot, um, uh, I, I take note of that because that's, there's probably a lot of birds using it. You know, if you see just two random doves on a, on a wire somewhere or sitting on the ground, I'm kind of like, eh, maybe. Right. Yeah. But if I see more than that, it's, I kind of, I go, oh, that, that carries a little more weight with me and it's, it's worth checking out. So when do you typically hunt for doves? Um, you know, as long as I'm not out chasing whitetails, it's, you know, September 1st to whenever our season ends. And that, that's been the case. You know, I hunt them over in Wisconsin and in, the, in North Dakota as well. And it's just, I like it early. I like it before I'm, I'm too caught up in the deer thing, but whenever I can, I just think it's such a good, it's just fun. And it's such a good thing to take the kids and the dog out on. So uh, how about what time of day? Like do you typically go in the mornings or evenings all day long? Uh, it depends when I can go again. You know, I mean, the nice thing about them is if you've, if you scouted enough, you can find places to have a, you know, a lunchtime hunt if you want. It might not be as productive as a morning or evening hunt, but you can still do it. You know, it's not, it's different you know, for some stuff, you know, you're like, you're not going to plan a duck hunt around noon probably, but doves, you could get away with it. And so it just, it depends what I'm scouting and what my schedule is like. Yeah. Just, I don't know. seems so casual. <laughs> you know, like whatever, it, it is. I mean, that's want. why it's, that's why it's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess walk us through your typical hunt. So it's, uh, maybe, maybe not opening day. Let's say the week after opening day and you decide, Hey, I've, you know, I've got a day free. How, how are you going to plan that day out? Um, if I'm hunting public land, so 
you know, my typical situation is I kind of try to avoid public land on the weekends. You know, I live here in the Twin Cities, and so the public land I hunt gets hunted hard on the weekends. And so let's say, you know, if I have a Tuesday free to go hunt, um, it just depends on what, what I've found scouting and when I can slip away. You know, a lot of times I'll get up in the morning and work for a few hours, and I'll grab the dog and go sit in one of those kind of midday loafing spots and see who's cruising through. And, you know, the thing about that is, you know, if you go out on a spot like that, I always carry my binoculars with me because when you spend two or three hours sitting there just watching, you know, you, you might be in the action, you might not, but you might see something that can clue you into where you have to move, or you might end up going out there and somebody else is sitting there. And so it's kind of a matter of getting out, you know, on the weekdays when I can. And if, you know, if I have a morning to go out at sunrise, I'll go. If I can go at, you know, 630 in the evening, I'll go then. It just, it just depends on what my life's like. So other than it being like a, just a nice day to be outside, is there any particular weather that's better than others that you find? Um, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen, I don't know if I've seen enough, you know, specific movement tied to weather to say that I, I believe that there's a, you know, a cold front or a moon phase or something that's going to affect doves. I, I, you know, my, my best hunts are seem to be the ones where it's just decent weather. You know, I don't mind sun out. I don't mind a little bit of wind. You know, I don't want too much wind, um, just cause they'll get on that and <laughs> they get harder to hit. Um, so I, you know, it's kind of like turkey hunting. I like, I like fair weather dove hunting. Yeah. So uh, going back to wind, is that, how's that affect your setup? Are you, is it like turkey, uh, duck hunting where wind is, you know, a huge part of what you're doing, or are you more concerned, like just getting covered up and see where they come from? Um, I just, I just get covered up, you know, wind, what, what I don't mind having a little wind for with doves is for the dog to recover them. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing about a lot of dove hunters is they, they don't use dogs. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, one of the few kinds of bird hunting where you don't really need them, but for the recovery aspect, you know, if you, if you have one cruising through and you nick him with a 20 gauge and he goes, sails out another hundred yards into the weeds or the cornfield or something. If you have a little bit of wind to help that dog track that down, that helps a lot. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about the dog a little bit more. Let's say you've got a, a retriever and uh, you like to play catch in the yard. Um, obviously you know a lot about dogs. How, how might you get your dog set up to, you know, start retrieving dust? Um, you know, the, the thing about if you got a retriever, if you have a dog with prey drive and retrieving desire, you don't have to teach them to retrieve a bird. They, they want to do that. I mean, you might have to teach them a little bit to bring that bird to you. And, you know, there, there's a whole aspect to that, but the, the benefit of dove hunting that kind of gets overlooked by maybe the average dog owner, the, the average hunting dog owner is the lesson in steadiness. And, you know, I interview dog trainers all the time for articles and for the sporting dog talk podcast. Like I, the, the common theme that comes up is you don't really have to train dogs to hunt. You have to train them to listen. And for a dog, a good dog to sit there by your side and just wait while the action unfolds till you send them to retrieve, that's an unnatural thing. They don't want to wait. You know, they want, they want to go. And so dove hunting is just an awesome opportunity to get that steadiness kind of locked into place, you know, you, and you want to work on it beforehand, obviously, but it's not such a big deal if your dog breaks dove hunting as maybe like duck hunting, you know, where you don't want your dog running out into the decoys or flaring the ducks or whatever. But if, if you, if you miss a dove opportunity, people don't tend to care as much. And so I just look at it as a really good hunting opportunity to get your dog on some birds, but to really work on that steadiness and control aspect of, of having a retriever. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems like so much of what we're talking about is with, with dove hunting. It's like kind of, you know, of course we're all, we're all there out there to, you know, capture a meal and, and that kind of stuff. But if, if it doesn't go well and you get some opportunities, it's kind of like, who cares? You know, it's, yep. it's, it's not going to eat at you the all night long that your you know, dog <laughs> blew your opportunity or whatever. Yep. For okay, sure. So, and it, you know, oh. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, that that's, that's the beauty of it. Like, I don't want to minimize, you know, dove hunting and, you know, say that there's an, isn't some consequences or whatever, but the reality is like, there's no trophy doves. Like, and you, like you said, you don't care. You're going to miss them. They're, they're going to get away. And so it's just kind of like a, it's a different feel than a lot of the hunting we do where, you know, that we, we put more weight onto the kill 
sometimes, especially in the big game world, this is it's rampant. But with with doves, it's just such a nice thing to to know that, you know, like you're not it doesn't matter. Like there's no ego behind it. It's just it's just a fun thing. And if you get some doves, it's awesome. And if you don't, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, other than if all your buddies are there watching you miss, then then you got a little bit <laughs> well, of peer pressure. But <laughs> yeah, if, if if they're my buddies, I don't worry about that because they're gonna miss too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as far as the hunting aspects, there's one last thing I wanted to touch on. If if you could give us any tips for uh, for these people that do go out on these like bigger hunts where maybe you're with a dozen people and you're all hunting the same field, um, if you have a choice of of where you're going to set up, what are some things that you're going to be looking for around that field as, as far as the base best place to be? Um, you know, looking for a place to hide, you know, if you can get in, if you, I, I just, I believe if you, you know, you were a little dove up there and you started hearing the guns go off and you looked and you could see people standing in three spots and you could see a spot where somebody wasn't standing, you, you might be inclined to go there. Like a little, something would fire in your little dove brain that says that's probably safer so find a place to hide and, you know, as long as you're not going to mess up somebody else on your hunt, if you're sitting there and they're, you know, they're, they're passing by at 75 yards instead of 25 move, you know, you, you just get to where they want to be. Yeah. Do they typically prefer like a low spot in the field or a high spot where they can see more or they they want to be, um, in like a little pocket or do they like being out in the open more? Um, they, they seem to like to see. You know, they seem to like to see, but if they're, it it just, it just depends so much on observation because everything, you know, the the situations vary so much. And my thing is I kind of do this with deer hunting too. Like if I see deer do something today, I can count on them probably doing it tomorrow. And with doves, if you see 10 doves pass through a spot now, you know, the next 10 are probably going to do that. So just get there and pay attention and, and use that, you know, maybe they are passing through a gap in the trees uh, maybe they're, you know, more likely their, their route you know, kind of depends on where their destination is. So I don't think they care, you know, if they got to fly a little bit higher to go over these oak trees or not. I think they just, they want point A to point B travel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I guess the last thing I want to touch on was, uh, how do you like to cook them? Uh, you know, obviously that's part of the fun part too, is they're, you know, I guess relatively easy to get and they're fun to eat. Oh yeah. I, I, I love them. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you can't go wrong with the bacon wrap popper deal, you know, especially if you're out, you know, sometimes we'll build in a dove hunting into one of our early, uh, deer meal deer hunts. And so you might be cooking back straps and bacon wrap doves on the grill at the same night, which is awesome. Um, sometimes I like to just, uh, you know, gather a whole bunch of peppers and asparagus and all kinds of vegetables and saute a bunch of dove breasts up in there and then serve it over rice or something that that's what I'll do. You know, my, my little girls, my wife, they're not big on jalapenos and I, I love jalapeno poppers, but they're not going to eat them. And so sometimes I'll just use it. Uh, if, if I get enough of them in some kind of sauteed up vegetable type of stir fry thing and, and cook them over rice, you just got to be careful there because they're so small. And, you know, there isn't any fat on a dove. And so it's, it's almost oh, yeah. like you gotta, you gotta cook everything and then add the dove breasts at the last minute. And it's just a couple minutes tops. And then, it, and then they won't dry out and be, you know, jerky. Yeah. You probably turn them to dry jerky pretty quick. Um, yep. Well, obviously like an easy Google search would probably bring up a hundred thousand recipes, but, but how do you do your poppers usually? Um, you know, jalapeno, you know, grab those little jalapenos, put some, uh, cream cheese in them and then just bacon wrap them, you know, and, and pin them. I typically pin them with a, with toothpicks. Um, but just simple, you know, and then, and then you're, uh, you're just grilling your dove breast and yep. Yep. Um, and you usually de-breast the bird, like you'll, uh, yep. it's just de-breast the bird and, and keep the breast and, and the rest is, you know, really there's nothing there. Yep. Cool. All right. So all right, we uh I think we covered dove hunting well enough. Let's 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 talk uh whitetail just a little bit. Uh so um give me a, give me like a couple um maybe something that you learned in the last year or something that you've started focusing on more in the last year with your public land whitetail hunts. Um I would say the thing that I I learned last year and I learn every single year is 
how wrong I typically am. <laughs> and, and like, you know, I know it sounds like a joke, but I'm being totally honest. So because of the style of hunting I do and the, this style that's, that's real popular right now, where it's kind of hang and hunt, go into public land, find fresh signs, set up a saddle or set up a stand. It, it's so heavily dependent on your pre hunt research, you know, your on X work and what happens, you know, not, I don't know what percentage of the time I would say at least probably 60, 70% of the time is I'll find these spots and identify them. And I'll, I'll have my mind made up that that that's where, you know, that's where the early season bucks are going to be, or that's where the rut action is going to happen. You know, whatever time I'm hunting. And then I walk in there and there's something isn't right about it either. You know, you can't set up the way you want to, or the sign isn't there. Um, something, something that you can't pick up from aerial photography, but you see in person goes, uh, this, this isn't right. And instead of pushing that program, it's time to move on to plan B, C, D, and really be open to the possibility that you're going to get this stuff wrong. How do you typically approach a hunt like that? So if you're doing an out of state hunt, um, how, how are you balancing your scouting and hunting when you let's, let's say it's during the middle of the season. So you're not showing up before the hunt, but you've got a certain number of days to hunt, uh, but you, you know, you don't have all your spots set up. How do you balance those? Um, you, you try to try to be real efficient, man. Like it's a, it's a hard thing to do, you know, just for example, this Nebraska trip I'm taking, I, my buddy and I, we built in two days to just glass and scout and ground truth our aerial photography scouting. And that's a huge benefit, you know, two full days to just do that, figure out what we're getting right, what we're getting wrong and watch is a big deal. You know, if I'm heading out to, you know, North Dakota or somewhere else mid season, I'm hunting a new spot. Uh, I'm still going to try to build in a fair amount of glassing and, and kind of like boots on the ground scouting. So it's, it's a hard thing to do because you're kind of giving up hunting. You might be, you might be hunting while you're doing it, but the main focus is to learn and to watch. And so most people won't do that. It's like, you know, if you're going to go on a four or five day hunt, six day hunt, giving up any time of any hunting time to scout is a hard thing to do, but it's so beneficial to figure out what's really going on. How do you approach balancing, not blowing a whole area out, scouting and, and hunting it? Like, do you just kind of, you know, it's, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. You know, that whole thing about, you know, we, we kind of have been led to believe that if you, if you bust deer out of there, it's over for you. And, you know, I see that with elk. Like if I, if I blow elk out of a basin, it's like, I, I have to move cause they are, they are gone. So, but deer don't, they have a small home range and, you know, you think if you go in and you bust them that they're just going to be gone or you're going to, you're going to ruin your hunt. And that just hasn't been my experience. Now, like, I don't, I don't advocate like just being cavalier and, and strolling through a place and not caring if you blow stuff out, you still got to be careful and think about the wind and you got to try to be real precise on where you're going in and what you're looking at. But I don't worry that much. You know, if I, if I have a pond mark that I want to walk into and look at and see if it's worth hanging a stand, if I walk in there and I jump some deer off of it, you know, like that's just, that's like the price of admission. That's just going to happen. But that doesn't mean you can't set up and kill deer in there. Yeah. Something I struggle with on these, these type of hunts is, um, just leaving ground scent and that like, sometimes I feel like I'd be better off just like, especially if, you know, let's say I haven't been there in a full year or, uh, maybe I haven't been there at all. I'm just kind of going in blind. And am I better off just like walking as much area as I can and don't worry about it? Or, um, should I, you know, strategically hit these spots that I cyber scout and, and not blow them before I go into that, you know, it's, um, for me, that's something like, you know, it may change hunt to hunt how I feel about that. Well, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I'm a big advocate of, of kind of precision. You know, if there's an area I want to see, I figure out a way to get in there and get out. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't like aimless, you know, scouting, you know, like, I don't like, well, you know, maybe I'll go into this area, look around and go over here and, you know, follow this butterfly here for a while. I, I kind of like to have a plan because it it is easy to get distracted. And if you go in you, and you're kind of like, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to check this area out. It's really easy to 
you know, not accomplish a whole lot. And so if you kind of do your homework ahead of time and you're like, okay, I'm going in here, I'm going to look at if there's tracks, if there's whatever, I'm, I'm hanging a stand. If not, I'm hiking right back out and I'm going to the second spot. Usually if you've got a few places like that, if you've given yourself some options, you're going to find one or two where you're like, yeah, this is, this is going to work out. Yeah. I mean, my thought is like a, let's say a transition line, uh, between like two ages of timber and, you know, it's like several hundred yards long. So you could cyber scout that and try to find like, okay, well, I'm going to hit this corner here or find this, you know, that's a little bit lower here or, you know, or you could scout that whole line, you know, walk the transition line. So you're not aimless, you know, you've got a specific yep. you're looking for that spot. Um, but obviously once you walk that transition line, every deer that crosses where you path, I mean, that path knows, okay, well there's, there's hunters in here now. So, um, yeah. So, you know, in that situation, one of the things that if, if I'm hunting, if, if I'm going during the season and I find a, you know, hard edge or a soft edge like that, that's, you know, several hundred yards long, I'll probably set up an observation stand. So I'll probably play it safe and get in a tree somewhere where I might arrow something if it comes by, but I can see as much of that as possible. And if I see a deer pop out in a certain spot or travel it a certain way, then it's time to move. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's just, it's, it's all dependent on, it, it's dependent on a lot of variables. I mean, some spots you can't watch, you know, if you've got a pond down in a hole, you probably can't see it. You can't see who's coming and going, you know, if you're hunting big wood stuff, if you're, if there isn't a way to observe, you're going to just have to get in there and check it out. And so that, I mean, that's the price you pay, but you know, when you work with bird dogs a lot, you, you have to figure out how to, how to kind of beat their noses. You know, you, people will say, well, you can, you can't beat a deer's nose. He's going to know you're there every time. And I don't working with bird dogs. I don't believe that. I think there are ways where, you know, it, it's not a hundred percent where you can beat a whitetail's nose, but you can certainly give yourself some advantages. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, all right. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about your, your podcast. I think, I think the, the bird dog podcast, like if you're into that, that to me seems like a no brainer and probably not a whole lot of explanation needed, um, other than, you know, how long you've been doing it and that kind of stuff. And then I'm interested in some of the guests you've had on your other podcast. Yeah, man. Um, you know, it's called sporting dog talk. You can find it everywhere that, that you can find podcasts and it's, it, it leans pretty heavy on the, the bird dog thing, but I I'm really interested in just dogs with a job. So I'm not, I'm not locked into, it has to be hunting dogs. I mean, we've done episodes on, uh, you know, a guy who trains, uh, shepherds to find, uh, endangered sea turtles down in, in Texas. And we've done, you know, episodes where this, this, uh, retired game warden used to find cartel grow sites on public land with Belgian Malinois. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm interested in cool stories about dogs and understanding the process of getting a good one and how to train them and how to pick the right pedigree and all that stuff. And so we, we cover a lot of different stuff like that on, on sporting dog talk. And then the other one is hunt for real. And it's, it's primarily bow hunting, but we do cover, we do cover some gun hunting and other stuff, but it's all DIY and it's just, uh, kind of the working man's, you know, like here are the opportunities, here's how to do it. Here are these people who've been successful. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a fun one. You know, we get to talk about elk and Western critters and a lot of whitetails and we'll do some, we'll do some bird episodes this fall. And it's just, it's just fun, you know? Yeah. I mean, the crazy, there's so many podcasts right now. That's almost like there's no way you can know about all of them. So sometimes it just takes, you know, <laughs> just stumbling upon one and, and something you're interested in and it turns out you love it. So, um, yeah. What, what episodes, uh, would you recommend if somebody's just wants to check that one out? Um, man, it, you know, it depends what you're interested in. We've, we've done some really good how to public land whitetail episodes. Um, we, you know, Darren McDougall on, who's a fellow outdoor writer, who's done a lot of, a lot of DIY public land whitetail stuff. Um, if you're into the Western thing, we, we, we've done several elk episodes that have been really fun. Um, we just recently dropped an episode with this, this guy named JC Navarro, who's a, he's a really good elk caller. And so his advice on finding, you know, public land bulls and how to call them is it's pretty cool. Um, so those, those are worth checking out depending on, you know, where your interests lie. Yeah. Well, the elk calling could be really timely if somebody catches that in the next couple of weeks. For sure. 
Um, great. Well, I, you, thanks so much for coming on. I could tell you also, it, Tony's writing is everywhere across the web. Just he mentioned all those magazines earlier he's written for, which are now basically websites. Um, if you Google Tony J. Peterson, his, you know, there's a lot of content out there with your name on it. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, it's pretty cool You're doing this for a living. And I guess I guess the last thing I wanted to ask you about is if somebody is interested in becoming an outdoor writer, what's your you know, what's your recommendation for a career path for them? Uh, man, I get asked this all the time by people and it's you, you have to love writing. And so, you know, people will say, well, I'm a good writer and I'll say, okay, do you write? And they'll say, well, I, you know, I haven't written since high school or college. And to me, it's kind of like one of those things, like if you, if you're really compelled to do it, you'll do it. And so I, and I don't want to discourage anybody, but you know, be really honest about your desire and what you want to get out of it, because there are opportunities out there. If you want to, if you want to write about hunting and fishing and, and make a living at it, you can do it, but you've got to love that part of it. It's not, you can't just love hunting and fishing and hope that the other part comes. It has to go the other way first. And so, you know, be honest about what you want to get out of it. And the same goes for, you know, outdoor photography, um, I know a lot of people who who like to take pictures and want to make a living at it, you know, through hunting or filming hunting or whatever. And it's it's like you got to resign yourself to, OK, I'm going to I'm going to learn how to run a business around this skill or this passion and then tie it into hunting first. And it's, you know, a lot of people want to put the hunting first and it's this just doesn't work very well. So I don't know if this is like an either or thing, but would you recommend just starting your own blog or starting your own website and doing that kind of stuff? Or would you recommend writing the stuff and then just send it out until you find somebody that wants to publish it? I would recommend going to somebody who's a publisher now. Um, you know, it's, it's like you mentioned with the podcast, there's 800 million podcasts out there right now. And so, yeah, you go start one, but how do you differentiate yourself? You know, how do you, how do you build an audience? And if you go, you know, to say an editor of some magazine or, you know, publisher of some content somewhere, they've, they have an audience and they'll probably give you a chance. And so the, the best bet would be to query them and say, here's my ideas. Um, you know, can I, can I write these for you or can, will you give me a shot, write it on spec? And they probably will, but you have to, if you, if you're going to do that, you know, pay real close attention to their guidelines. They're going to have some kind of writer's guidelines for you. You know, they're going to say, hey, keep it at 600 words or 800 words or 1400 words. Uh, I need these pictures. I need, you know, subheads, midheads, however, whatever style that editor wants, you know, the, the whole the whole process gets a lot easier and you'll get a lot more work if you actually make editors jobs easier. So you meet your deadlines and you write to the way they want it. And in, so you have to learn to kind of blend your style of like, okay, this is how I like to write. This is what they want. And I have to, I have to take what I like to do and make it, you know, fit it into their format. So obviously you're well beyond this point, but how often does somebody do that? And, and they come back and the editor's like, ah, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think fairly often, but <laughs> I, I will say this, you know, it's, you know, failure is okay. Like every, you're not going to meet a writer out there who hasn't been rejected a lot, believe okay. me. And so it's like anything else, you know, we, anything worthwhile probably sucks to start with, you know, working out, training a dog, um, you know, learning how to hunt, all of it is hard, you know, being a writer, it's, it's not easy to develop that skill, but you know, if, if an editor is honest with you and like, man, you just, this, you know, it was too long. You, you know, your, your sentences would run on, you got to learn, you know, you got to learn some grammar. If you want to keep at it, that's, that's valuable advice. It sucks to hear, but it's, it's worth hearing. And, you know, if you stick with it, you can, you can get somewhere with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. I, I think you brought a lot of, uh, enlighten us on a lot of different topics. So I, I appreciate you squeezing me in before, you know, Nebraska hunt. <laughs> uh, well, man, Man, I appreciate you having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I wish you luck. And yeah, maybe we'll have to have you back to, to talk some more whitetail. Awesome. Well, thank you. All right. Well, well, thanks so much, Tony. It was uh, great talking to you and great meeting you. And uh, like I said, good luck the rest of the season. All right. Thanks. You too.